Hello and welcome to this webinar on the action guide to prepare for the inevitability of hybrid data. My name is Pradeep Banat. I'll be your moderator today. I'm joined today by Matt Asled, who's a research vice president at 451 Research, who will be in conversation with Jeff Wies, Actian CMO. They will be followed by a presentation by Emma McGratton, Actian Senior Vice President of Engineering. Just a reminder to everybody, if you have questions, you can just enter them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, so a replay will be sent to you after the event. With that, I'll hand over to Matt and Jeff. Hi, I'm Matt Aslett. I'm Research Vice President for Data, AI and Analytics at 451 Research. So within the uh, data AI and analytics channel, we cover it, everything that entails from back-end data platforms through data management, data integration, data governance, uh, through to analytics, uh, data science, and obviously increasingly focused on uh, AI and machine learning as well. Um, today we're here to talk about trends that are going on in the industry. And, and the big question is cloud and its role. Um, and you've discussed cloud as perhaps the default business environment. What is it and, and why do you make that claim? Yeah, and I think, you know, certainly in terms of uh, perhaps the default business environment, maybe it's a step, uh, you know, an exaggeration, but certainly a default business environment, especially we've seen increasingly for data processing and analytics workloads. Uh, the, the trajectory is towards more and more of those uh, workloads being deployed in as a service environments, be it you know, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service. And the, the volume of, of workloads deployed in traditional non, uh, on-premises, non-cloud environments is decreasing. Of course, it's not going to zero, but you know, that's the, the general trajectory is, is towards more of those mission critical uh, workloads running in the cloud. And those use cases that are going to the cloud, are they new use cases or are they repurposed existing use cases or is it a combination? Yeah, I think, you know, that is one of the key questions. I think, you know, as an industry, we, we fall into a bit of a trap over the last few years of talking about everything moving to the cloud and companies lifting and shifting workloads to the cloud. And some of that is happening, definitely. But actually, we see a lot of repurposing of existing applications going to the cloud. Obviously, a lot of new workloads are, are being developed specifically to take advantage of cloud architecture, both but both in the public cloud and also using cloud native technologies on premises. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of workloads that are remaining on premises, either just to live out their useful life and then be retired or to be repurposed and re-architected, uh, you know, with a new infrastructure architecture. And is there any sort of uh, indicator or catalyst, transactional versus non-transactional, uh, traditional BI dashboards versus ad hoc? Is there uh, particular flavors of use cases that seem to, seem to swing to the cloud versus remain on premise? Yeah, again, that's something we've been trying to get a little bit more detail on, you know, through our, through our surveys and, and talking to end users. Um, because it is a little bit all over the place. I mean, some companies have moved very aggressively and have moved transactional workloads to the cloud. For a lot of organizations, those are the kind of workloads they're very cautious about moving. Um, and what we see is in our data that all of those workloads are moving towards the cloud, uh, some faster than others. And in particular, sort of business intelligence dashboards seem to be uh, shifting more, 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 more quickly towards uh, a cloud environment than say a traditional transactional, uh, you know, run the business uh, application, which is, which is what you would expect, but it does vary from organization to organization. Okay. You've uh, introduced this concept of data gravity. What is that and why is that important? Yeah, so the, the, the concept of data gravity, I'll, I'll admit we didn't, we didn't introduce it, but I think we, we, we picked up on it pretty uh, quickly a few years ago. Uh, and it is something I think, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's logical and it, and it makes sense. Uh, but something that initially is, is probably a bit foreign. Essentially, you know, obviously the more data uh, resides in, for example, cloud storage and is generated in cloud storage, then that has a gravitational pull on the analytic workload to, uh, you know, to analyze that data. Um, I think, you know, perhaps one of the, 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 the ways that's been a little bit misunderstood is that that 
that means everything is therefore being pulled to the cloud because obviously more and more data is being deployed uh, uh, and, and stored in the cloud. But of course, as uh, you know, as we've seen, a lot of workloads remain on premises. There's a lot of sunk cost in existing on-premises infrastructure. There's a lot of workloads that companies are wary about moving to the cloud for you know, security or regulatory reasons. And so that has gravitational pull as well. So I think this is something a lot of organizations are struggling with is that gravitational equilibrium or figuring out where the, 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 the gravity is strongest and where it makes sense to move some workloads and not others. Uh, so it's not a cloud only thing. It, it's something that, just to be clear, data gravity also is relevant to on-premise use cases. And is, is that the assertion? Yes, definitely data gravity is not a cloud only thing. I think it, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of organizations or people will associate it with cloud. Obviously, it's because cloud storage has a real gravitational pull. And particularly, we see this, this movement towards the separation of compute and storage and bringing compute workloads, analytic workloads, to bear on data that's in a cloud storage environment. But equally, you know, it, there, as I said, there is a, a gravitational pull caused by existing investment and workloads that are on, on premises. Okay. Um, and when we look at databases themselves, there's all different flavors of them, relational, analytical, transactional, big data, no SQL. Are some moving to the cloud faster or in a stronger fashion than others and why? That is a very interesting question. I think, you know, in terms of the different database types, different database workloads, and and the, the whether they're being deployed in different locations. I think, you know, some of that comes down to, obviously, a lot of uh, deployments that are using new NoSQL databases, for example, are in relation to perhaps not mission critical or new emerging applications, and those are more likely to be deployed in the cloud. Um, that said, obviously, we saw a lot of development and tests going on with existing relational databases, and a lot of that might be happening in the cloud, even if the, the resulting application ends up being deployed on premises. So it, it really, there really is a mix. I'd say, you know, if, we, if you're looking at newer technologies, newer, newer database types, newer data platforms, there perhaps is a tendency for them to be uh, being adopted in the cloud more, more readily, but it, you know, it really depends on the nature of the workload and the application, and of course the data and the nature of that data, whether it, uh, uh, whether it is suitable for, for being deployed uh, in the cloud. Okay. You said migration patterns uh, in terms of companies moving from a legacy system to something more modern um, is, <laughs> is more following the uh, metaphor or the example of birds having different migration patterns as opposed to uh, there being a singular best practice or best way to do that. Is that a flaw or a feature? Uh, why do migration patterns have uh, diversity and difference? And, and what's, what's behind that and is that a good thing? In terms of why we started talking about migration patterns was because I think as well as an industry and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll own up to this myself personally, we fall into a trap sometimes of talking about everything moving to the cloud or you know, think workloads lifting and shifting to the cloud. And you know, it is important to think about the nuances and the, and the fact that you know, some workloads don't lend themselves to, to, to actually being deployed in the cloud. Some workloads may, but organizations may want to refactor the application um, or, or simply or, or shift that to a new version of the application. So it's not lift and shift, it's really about uh, a new version. And actually we see, particularly with mission critical legacy workloads, about 35% of respondents saying they're gonna keep those workloads in place, but modernize the architecture, modernize the application that supports uh, that workload in an on-premises environment. And so, you know, we do see a growing investment in, in private cloud and on-premises cloud native architecture. So I think it's really a matter of just thinking about the nuances and therefore then thinking about those workloads. What are the performance requirements? What are the, inter, uh, the, the connectivity and integration requirements for those workloads, for the, the database workloads in particular? And then 
where does it make sense for those to run? And therefore, do you migrate those to the cloud or do you modernize on premises or you just let them live out their natural life and, and, and replace them with something new? So there's, you know, there's various, various ways of doing that. And, and you know, equally, I suppose back to the metaphor, you know, we think about clouds, uh, sort of birds migrating. Obviously, they don't all migrate to the same place and some don't migrate at all. Databases are exactly the same. And, and just to uh, reiterate, when you say modernize in place, could you define what does that mean to you? And what, when people decide to do that, what would be the top one or two primary drivers for people to decide to modernize in place? Yeah, I think in terms of modernizing in place, there's a number of reasons why organizations would, would, would do that. Um, I think obviously a, a, an, an existing investment in both the database software and obviously the underlying infrastructure is one. Application dependencies might be another. Data sovereignty requirements, data regulatory, regulatory requirements as well. Um, so from, in terms of modernization, I think what the way we think about that is, is uh, you know, keep the, the essence of the application and the architecture, the fact that it's on-premises, the same, but obviously might perhaps migrate to the newest version of the database, take advantage of uh, you know, uh, additional functionality that's in there. Probably um, uh, adopts you know some some cloud native architecture uh, underneath that database to en to enable uh, greater automation orchestration. I mean, it would depend on on the level of uh, of functionality that's available today. But that's the the trajectory. It's it's about modernizing that application and that that database uh, stack to take advantage of a a more cloud like architecture, even if it's on premises. Okay, um, and. Now you've made a bold claim that the future is hybrid. What do you mean by that? And when you're talking about that, are there particular use cases that are exemplars of that claim? Why is the future hybrid? Yeah, so I, we see the future is hybrid. It's uh, it's it, it's actually you know a statement of fact because that you know that's what our, our customers tell us. I think for a long time. You know, hybrid was something that companies kind of stumbled into. They didn't deliberately set out to create a hybrid art strategy. And that, but that's what we see organizations are doing now. Actually, in a recent survey, we saw 57% organizations said that's specifically what they're doing, running on-premises infrastructure and cloud infrastructure in an integrated fashion. And that's what we mean by true hybrid architecture, is that integrated fashion. It's multiple reasons for doing that. Interestingly, the top one we see is, is uh, the, the potential potential to move workloads between those multiple architectures. Of course, the extent to which companies are actually doing that is, is questionable uh, because there's a lot of cost and complexity involved in, in moving workloads around, but they want to have the freedom to do that if they choose to based on a number of things like the, the, the performance and, and the cost and um, you know the, the extent to which they're, they're using those workloads and obviously you know the greater usage perhaps uh, you know there, there's an argument towards moving it from one location to, to another then there's sort of development and test there's backup and recovery so there's multiple there really are multiple reasons why that hybrid architecture is now you know, becoming increasingly the strategic choice. It's obviously not the only choice, but I want to say everybody's going hybrid, but it's increasingly the strategic choice. Okay. What should people look for in their data warehouses to deal with being able to operate on real-time fresh data? So, so yeah, in terms of uh, the, the rise of real-time, if you like, or, or the increased focus on real-time, we, we definitely see that that's happening. Um, you know, obviously, uh, stream processing and, and uh, near real-time data processing has been around for many, many years. But I think uh, traditionally it's been quite a niche area where there were ve the very highest performance requirements in financial services, for example. Obviously, we see that now spreading across to more and more industries uh, in e-commerce and retail and, uh, and advertising, for example. And, and, you know, all manner of industries now where companies need to be operating on uh, the, the real-time data as it's coming into the organization, as it's being generated. But obviously, what is key to that is obviously working with that data in the context of the historical data as well. And so... A, a good example of that is obviously perhaps in, in machine learning and actually running machine learning models in production. 
you may do the training of that on historical data and in, in a, an on-premise or, or cloud environment, but actually in terms of the speed of analysis for inferencing, you may be running that out there, you know, either on a, an application on a mobile device or on a, uh, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a, a device uh, out there at the edge. So it's that combination of functionality uh, that is uh, increasingly required. And uh, could you talk to uh, traditional data warehouses and how often they struggle with performance when they're updating their data um, and, and wh why that's something that people have to pay attention to, that, that whole concept of a performance penalty if you have lots of data updates. Yeah, I think it, with, with traditional data warehousing, I mean, obviously the, the data warehouse has been, you know, a relatively successful, uh, you know, architecture, if you like, uh, over the years. And But what it was particularly good for is if when you knew in advance what questions you wanted to ask on the data that was being generated and you modeled your warehouse to, to respond you know to those queries on the, on that data as it, as it was uh, as it was collected what where the data warehouse has, has struggled and we've seen a lot of organizations have, have looked there for for other solutions is when the data is changing or the questions change and you know that's when you know the, the, the you can really get performance penalties in terms of having to go back and remodel uh, the data re, you know rearchitect the data warehouse um, and and also just uh, at, at greater scale as well obviously the more successful environment is perhaps the, the greater number of users you have the greater number of queries and you know you can really end up with some significant performance uh, challenges so i think you know a lot of organizations have become quite frustrated perhaps with the you know the promise of the data warehouse where it has failed to deliver um, and have looked at, at uh, other approaches let's talk about distributed data what is in your definition your in your view what is distributed data and why is it important to think about it or consider it? And what are the challenges in dealing with distributed data? I suppose, you know, to some extent, every, every, every organization's data is distributed to some extent. You distribute it across different data silos, different databases, different environments, regional or, or, or different departments and groups within an organization. Increasingly, of course, that's becoming increasingly uh, distributed across multiple cloud environments, uh, you know, multiple data centers. Um, and so I'd say it, when we think about organizations from a, a distributed data management perspective, the challenge is understanding what data you have, where it is, uh, how that's used, and then, and then attempting at the very least to, to try and manage that as a, uh, if not a single environment, at least a, a coherent ecosystem of, of different environments. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's, there's obviously multiple challenges with that. And that is growing, um, even though we think, you know, hybrid is, is uh, inevitable and there are benefits to hybrid IT architecture. Clearly there are challenges in terms of managing data distributed across that, that estate. And, and one thing we do see is, is actually the, the, the more uh, that organizations are trying to take advantage of, of data in multiple locations, they're potentially the, the, the more data silos they end up with. And that, that kind of speaks to the fact that it's, it's, it, I was going to say something's broken. It's not that it's not broken, but it's not quite fixed. Uh, you know, the, the, all the pieces of the puzzle are there. They're not quite being assembled in a con, into a coherent whole in such a way that it enables uh, organizations to actually manage all their data and to do so in a, in a connected and synchronized manner. So as, in, as we talk about distributed data, the topic of multi-cloud in particular comes up what do we mean by multi-cloud? Is it important? And what do people need to be looking for in a solution when they are thinking about a multi-cloud uh, environment? So I think from, from a multi-cloud perspective, uh, the, the, one of the key things to consider is you know, can you run that, that, that database environment in multiple clouds, including your own data center? And uh, a lot of vendors will talk about the ability to do that, but can't necessarily deliver that in a, in a coherent uh, and consistent fashion. So for example, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the uh, cloud data warehousing environments only run in, in uh, the cloud or may run in multiple clouds, but not necessarily on, on, a, on a customer's data center. Of course, a lot of the existing uh, database data warehouse environments can also be deployed in the cloud, but 
deploying a database in the cloud yourself and managing it in that environment is quite different from consuming a, a, a managed service delivered you know, through, through the cloud. So I think you have to be very clear about what it is you know, that the options are and, and what are you potentially consuming. And I think the, the long-term goal is obviously not just to have a consistent experience by running the same database in multiple different environments, but actually to have uh, you know, a, a hybrid data warehouse environment that's designed specifically to run across multiple environments and enable you to manage data and query data in a federated fashion across those multiple environments. Yeah, so, so I think in conclusion, or to sort of boil it down to the, 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 the few key points that we see that are, that are driving you know, trends right now. Uh, the first is obviously that the, the cloud is, is very real. It's becoming increasingly a default business environment. Uh, particularly for for database workloads, and you know we see that general trajectory is towards the cloud or as a service adoption. Uh, data gravity is very real, and it is one of the factors that is that is driving uh, those analytic workloads uh, to the cloud um, to to enable analysis of data that's increasingly stored in the cloud. Uh, that said, data gravity works both ways, and clearly there's a lot of existing investment on data processing and, uh, and infrastructure architecture on premises. There's a lot of valid reasons why uh, specific workloads may not be suitable to be deployed in the cloud, uh, or you know, data volumes are so great that it doesn't make sense or from a cost or complexity, complexity basis to move them to the cloud. Um, and so modernizing those workloads in place, as I say, is, is, is absolutely a valid uh, argument. And we see that increasingly organizations are looking to do that. And so that's why we say, I think, you know, inevitably uh, the, the future is hybrid for most organizations. They are going to have a mix of cloud data processing uh, services and existing on-premises um, uh, data processing architecture, which will increasingly be, be modernized. And in order to do that, in order to deliver that, you need to have a data processing architecture, a data warehousing uh, software that is designed specifically to, to, to work across a hybrid environment um, rather than being something that's ported uh, either from the cloud or from, a data, uh, from an on-premises environment um, uh, because it needs to, to interoperate across uh, those multiple environments and enable synchronization and analysis of data uh, wherever it resides. And finally, as people think about planning out and putting their strategy for hybrid, what are maybe the first three things they should do as they stand back and take a look at both their existing environment, their business needs? How do people get started um, in terms of uh, putting a hybrid data management strategy together? I think, you know, the, 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 the key point uh, there is it should be thoughtful. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not a matter of identifying, uh, you know, everything should move to the cloud or everything needs to stay on premises or everything's going to the edge. It's looking at each individual workload. What are the data processing requirements? How is the data being generated? How is it being used? What is the nature of that data in terms of, uh, you know, things like data privacy uh, um, and, and, and looking at each of those, uh, you know, in quite a, a nuanced fashion and then deciding where is the most appropriate uh, location for, for that workload, um, you know, based on that combination of, 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 uh, of consideration. So that does mean, you know, there's no simple answers. There is a lot of work going to be involved. But, you know, the opportunities are, are there if you think about it in a, in a very thoughtful uh, way. Thank you, Matt and Jeff, for that enlightening discussion. Now I'd like to turn it over to Emma McGrattan, Actian's Senior Vice President of Engineering. Emma will be giving us her thoughts on the future of hybrid cloud data warehousing. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Emma. Thanks, Pradeep. And thanks, Matt. That was really interesting and validated a lot of the thinking uh, that we have here at Actian. Next slide, Pradeep. So as Pradeep said, I'm Emma McGrattan. I lead research and development for the Actian's hybrid data analytics portfolio, uh, which is the, uh, the topic of today's conversation. 
I love to speak at industry conferences and um, I'm actually getting uh, a little tired of being at home and not having the ability to speak in front of a, uh, a live audience that we can see in the room. I've been in Actian Engineering for over 25 years and if you want to continue the conversation, uh, you can reach me at LinkedIn. Fortunately, there aren't too many Emma McGrattans. Next slide, Pradeep. We really focus on innovation and a lot of that uh, innovation happens in the area of performance and time and again we prove through industry benchmarks uh, that we are the, uh, the fastest analytics database uh, that there is uh, both on-premise and in the cloud and we have over 50 patents in this area. You'll see some logos on the screen for some of our customers and if you visit our website uh, there's success stories for many of these uh, some of them really exciting uh, like University of Oxford's Clinical Trial Services Unit uh, seems to be um, you know, heading pretty fastly towards the uh, development of a, a vaccine for COVID. So uh, some really cool customers doing some really cool things and, uh, and using our data technologies to do it. In 2018, we took a strategic investment from HCL Technologies. Uh, if you haven't heard of HCL, they're a $10 billion uh, global system integrator, and they also have some fairly cool technologies that they're uh, developing, and uh, they're bringing us into uh, many of their accounts uh, to help solve some difficult data challenges. Next slide. So uh, if we talk about you know, preparing for the inevitability of hybrid data, I would have a, a checklist in place that I need to think through uh, when choosing a hybrid data warehousing platform. So the first thing, obviously, if, if we're going to look at hybrid is that it needs to be truly hybrid in terms of deployment options. So it would need to be uh, something that I could deliver on premises um, in the cloud or clouds of my choosing, and also through VPC. And if you're not familiar with the term VPC, it's a virtual private cloud uh, where you have your own private infrastructure carved out of public cloud infrastructure. So uh, that's the, uh, the first box that needs to be checked. Next up would be the ability to unify through a federated query. So what that means is I want the ability to write a single query that can access data across all of these environments without having to move the data. So federated query capability uh, is something that uh, should be on the checklist. Then I'd want to have a solution that I can scale dynamically, right? So, uh, you know, cloud offers this elastic scalability and I want to be able to take advantage of that with the data warehousing solution that I select. Uh, talking about scaling compute dynamically, it will be important to me to be able to scale compute independently from storage. Because think about it, if I am, let's say I'm in retail, I'm coming up to the end of year and uh, there's a lot of holiday shopping going on, right? And I'm doing constant analysis of the data and making sure that I'm on, I've got all of my products in the right place at the right time, the supply chains are aligned and, and so on. And maybe I want to double or quadruple uh, the compute power that I'm using for that time of year. Um, I don't want to quadruple the storage that I'm using. The, the storage isn't changing that much. I just want to bring in more horsepower from a compute perspective. So being able to scale compute independently from storage is something that's important uh, for a, a modern data warehouse. I also want to be able to achieve high performance on commodity hardware. I don't want to have specialist hardware. Um, I want to be able to, uh, to deploy on servers from the vendor of my choosing and to get that type of performance that, um, that you would typically associate with products that are built on uh, proprietary hardware. And we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Um, I also want to be able to get that performance on the cloud, right? So if the solution is designed for commodity hardware, um, cloud is nothing but commodity hardware at massive scale. Um, so if it can deliver that um, performance on premise on commodity, it certainly can deliver that performance in the cloud as well. Matt mentioned uh, real-time operational information. And um, to me, it would be important to be able to have real-time updates uh, within my data set. So, you know, as I'm transacting business, I want to see the results of that uh, reflected in the data that I'm analyzing. Um, and I want to do that without having a, to pay a performance penalty, right? So for some technologies, you'll see that as you're updating the data, uh, performance might drop by 40% or so. I don't want the, that to happen with my um, modern hybrid data warehousing platform. And then the last thing's kind of a stretch goal here, um, but something that I'd like because I've seen it done, um, is the ability to seamlessly connect to 
applications and data sources across my organization. So I want the ability to connect to SaaS apps. Maybe I'm using Salesforce and I want to pull in um, my customer contact information for a customer 360 project that I'm doing. But having that built in um, uh, integration capability uh, is important to me. So this is probably just the uh, the start of what could be a, a longer list. And if you have things you'd like to see added to the list, uh, I'd be happy to engage in a conversation on that. Next slide, please. So what is Actian Avalanche's hybrid cloud data warehouse? So the first is it's a technology that was designed to deliver high performance at scale. Uh, we set out to um, you know, beat everybody else in the market when it came to performance, and it's something that we prove time and again. Now, this high performance at scale, it's the scale of the data that you're using, and in fact, the, uh, the more data you're querying, the greater the performance differentiation is that we can deliver. It's also the scale of the number of users, right? So Actian, you know, when we go into uh, customers and to prospects, um, pretty much every one of them wants to equip every business decision maker with the ability to access the data that they need to make the best decisions for the business. So everybody gets a copy of Tableau or Power BI or, or the tool that they're choosing. Uh, they want to provide them with the ability to do ad hoc querying, right? So what Matt was talking about earlier, you know, drilling into the data, um, asking you know different questions. The questions are always changing, right? So that's important to us. And then the other thing for us was that uh, we want to be able to handle very complex queries, so that you know scale of the complexity of the query uh, is something that we address as well. So um, the that's the kind of the first design point for the solution. Uh, the next design point was taking the data integration technologies that are already part of Actian's portfolio and you know, seamlessly making them part of the platform. So uh, you have your data warehouses and your data integrations all within the same console. And um, we typically find that the first thing somebody wants to do once they create a data warehouse is start populating it with data. And we have the ability to take data from a myriad of sources uh, and bring that into the data warehouse. As with all cloud solutions, you want to pay only for what you're using. So we have the ability with Actian Avalanche to scale the resources that you're using to meet your business needs at any moment in time. Um, so you're paying only, you don't have to buy for peak, right? You pay for what you need at a uh, or pay for what you're using at an instance in time. Uh, we also have built into it the ability to identify periods of inactivity. So uh, let's say it's a Friday evening, you switch off your monitor, you forgot to shut down the service, and um, after a period of inactivity that you specify, uh, we will shut down the service for you. So typically it's about an hour. Um, if we haven't seen any new queries and the last query finished and uh, an hour has passed, uh, we'll shut the service down and save you some money. Uh, and then the third thing in the area of paying for what you use is that you know when you shut off the service, you're no longer paying for the, the compute resources. Um, and then the last thing on here is deployment flexibility. So as I mentioned today, uh, our solution is available on uh, AWS and also on Azure, and we're working hard uh, to deliver on GCP as quickly as we can. Uh, we have the ability to deploy, to deploy on premises. Um, so if you're on um, Windows, or Linux, or Hadoop, or whatever, uh, we have the ability to, uh, to provide an analytics solution uh, that will meet your needs. Next slide, please. So migrating your data warehousing platform uh, can be risky. And one of the things that we're aiming to do here is to de-risk that. And, and there's a couple of approaches that, uh, that we have for doing this. So first off, if you're, uh, for instance, in the, the top diagram here, let's say your current state is you're running a legacy data warehouse, maybe you've got uh, Teradata, and uh, you've got your data sources coming in, you're feeding your ETL processes, um, you, you populate the data warehouse, and then you're serving the needs of your data science and your business analyst uh, user community. Um, you may not want to go directly to cloud, right? It may be that you want to have a phased journey to the cloud. Uh, by selecting Actian Avalanche as a technology, you can decide uh, which applications you move to the cloud and which ones remain on premises for now. Uh, we will help you in doing an analysis of those applications and we'll identify you know, which applications are going to be kind of a, a no-brainer to move. Uh, in the migration project, you want to show success early. So 
picking on some low-hanging fruit and showing early success can be important for the motivation of the team. Um, so you could decide that uh, there's certain applications that will remain on premises, there's certain applications that you want to move to the cloud, um, and we will help you uh, figure that out, uh, and more importantly, um, do an analysis of what it's going to take to get there and work with you to deliver on that next generation uh, platform uh, for your business. So we have the ability to deploy on-premises on cloud, and it gives you the ability to uh, decide upon the pace of the journey that you want to make to the cloud. Typically, yeah, forklifting your Teradata appliance to the cloud um, is not going to be a, a pleasant uh, or successful experience. Um, so you know, taking the time to figure this thing out, uh, doing it in a phased approach, um, you know, moving the applications that, uh, that are easiest to move all makes sense and, and are all enabled uh, by the fact that we can deliver this hybrid platform. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier separation of compute and storage, um, and what this enables is that you can scale the resources to meet the changing needs of your business. So, um, from a very simplistic perspective, we have our storage uh, at the top of the screen here, and uh, in this case, we're using Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. Um, and then our compute resources um, for our mid-quarter business needs, you'll see that I've said uh, we're going to use a four-node cluster. Um, so, uh, what happens here is the data in the Actian Avalanche um, storage lake um, gets divided into partitions, right? So, think of it just as uh, you've got a pie and you're cutting it up into slices. And then, uh, when we start up our cluster, that responsibility for those data partitions is allocated to the four nodes that we have. And we do that in a round robin fashion. So, we what we want to do is to give each of the compute nodes an equal number of slices of the pie and um, because you want to keep them all equally busy right so let's say that uh, we're in retail and it's coming up to uh, end a quarter and uh, we're in the fourth quarter so it's busy and we want to scale our compute resources to meet the new business challenges right so we want to double the number of compute nodes that we have and what you'll see here is our data is unaffected by this scaling of the compute resources, right? The, we still have our end partitions sitting in there in our uh, Avalanche data lake. So now we are allocating the responsibility for the data in those nodes across eight nodes instead of four, uh, as we had previously, right? So what this is going to do is using that same round robin distribution of responsibility for these data slices, and we're going to divide it across eight nodes now instead of four. So we're doubling the horsepower, right? So we can meet the double the number of queries, or we can execute the same number of queries in half the time. Um, but we've got this ability to grow the horsepower uh, to meet the business needs. And then obviously, once the, uh, the end of quarter rush is over, we can go back to our regular four node deployment. Um, so really simple to, to scale up and back. And um, when you see the Actin Avalanche user interface, it's literally as simple as uh, a slider that you move along the, the, the bar and uh, you can increase the number of nodes. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that uh, we're really focused on performance. Um, and to prove that, we employed a third party to run a TPCH uh, industry benchmark. So if you're not familiar with TPCH, it's a uh, decision support benchmark um, that's designed to have um, medium to high complexity uh, decision support queries um, that are supposed to be uh, uh, business vertical neutral, um, so they're supposed to have broad applicability. Um, and this benchmark was done at 10 terabytes, and uh, what we did was we ran the benchmark with Snowflake, Redshift, and Avalanche uh, on equivalent configurations, so uh, as close as we could get for, for a configuration for each of the technologies. So what you'll see is that uh, in the top uh, graph here um, is the time it took to execute uh, all of the TPCH queries uh, for a single user. Uh, so for Avalanche, it's 349 seconds. Uh, for Redshift, it's almost twice that. Uh, but for Snowflake, look at that. It's uh, almost 3,000 seconds to complete that set of queries in Snowflake. Now, as you increase the number of users, because 
very rarely do we encounter an environment in which there's one user performing uh, the analytics. Um, so we've increased here to 20 uh, concurrent users. And what you'll see is that for Avalanche, it took us 1,900 seconds to complete um, all of the queries for those 20 users, as, whereas with Snowflake, that went to 21,000 seconds, uh, over 21,000 seconds. So what you'll see here is that we're almost well, we're over nine times faster than Snowflake in completing this set of queries on equivalent hardware, right? So there's, uh, there's two ways of looking at this, right? So if your business makes more money based upon the performance of your analytics, you want that raw performance, right? So you will, you, know, you could make a swap from Snowflake to Avalanche and get nine times the performance. But maybe, maybe being twice as fast as Snowflake is good enough for your business, right? And what you could do there is you could say, um, instead of running on the same hardware that I'm running or same infrastructure that I'm running on today, why don't we scale that back? Because I can still get massive performance benefits Benefits, uh, even if I was to go on half the hardware uh, that my Snowflake is deployed on today. So we're so confident that we can do this for you that we have put an offer in place uh, whereby if you engage with us now, uh, we guarantee that we will cut your Snowflake bill in half. And we hear all of the time from Snowflake customers that started out with a bill that was very affordable, um, but as they added more users and more workloads into the environment, um, the cost containment was quite difficult and things got uh, quite expensive. And what we are doing here is guarantee that we will cut that bill that you're paying to Snowflake today in half. Now, we have um, a lot of information around this on acting.com slash avalanche. And we also have a set of solutions advisors available. Uh, you can email them at asa at acting.com and uh, they can get you started on this uh, assessment and migration and just you know, prove this out because I can talk about our performance all day long, uh, but it's not until you see your data with your queries uh, running against Actian Avalanche that you'll truly believe um, the, the performance and, and the claims that we make around the performance of the technology. Next slide. So uh, real-time decision-making is really important, right? Matt, Matt was talking about real-time operational information, right? So what you want to be able to do in your business is as you're performing your analytics, you want assurances that you're running against the latest data, right? So as you're transacting business, you want those business transactions reflected in your data warehouse. And so you're not making decisions based upon how things were yesterday or how things were at the weekend when you last did your, uh, your data load. And you want to make sure that it's, uh, it's up to the minute view of what's happening inside uh, the business. And that's something that Actian Avalanche was designed for. Now we have a patent actually in the area of real-time updates um, that uh, allow us to uh, keep abreast of changes that are happening uh, within your business. So uh, we can uh, do uh, two different methods of real-time data ingestion. Uh, you can you know, stream data using Kafka or Spark, um, or you can uh, feed data via change data capture replication like HVR. Um, and you know, as you're transacting business in your ERP systems, feed those transactions into the data warehouse and, uh, and make sure that you're looking at the freshest data. Uh, we, in doing this, uh, we do not impact the performance of queries that are running against the data set to any great extent. Um, what we've seen with the competition is that you know, updating the data can actually slow everything down, everything else down by 40 to 60 percent. So we wanted to make sure that you have the real-time insights into uh, into the real-time data. Uh, we are known for uh, you know, sub-second performance. And in fact, one of the customers that I had um, on one of the earlier slides, um, Refinitiv, um, they require that they, they I'm sorry, they do uh, real-time uh, trading analysis, and they wanted to be able to, uh, to perform analysis within 20 milliseconds. I mean, that's the type of performance that Axion Avalanche can deliver upon and does deliver upon. Um, so uh, real-time insights into what's happening within your data. And as I mentioned earlier, that performance will scale with the volume of data, with the number of users, and with the uh, query complexity. Next slide, please. 
So if you look to the competition, you know, we beat them in terms of performance. Uh, we match them on a lot of the functionality they provide. Uh, we've got some areas in which we, uh, we show uniqueness. And one of those areas is uh, data integration. So we believe that we're the first and the only cloud data warehouse that's got data integration capabilities as part of the warehousing platform. So when you go into the Action Avalanche console, uh, it's not just data warehousing, but integration is right there. And you have the ability, once you create a warehouse, to populate that with data. You can you know, set up uh, your integration jobs that will take data from, let's say, it's Salesforce. Maybe you want to have a, a regular dump of Salesforce data into the warehouse. Uh, maybe you want to take data from a Parquet file that's sitting on S3. Whatever it may be, uh, we've got uh, integration um, templates uh, that will help you um, handle those integrations uh, without the need to bring in a third party uh, integration technology. So uh, first off, uh, that was important to us here was seamless interoperability, right? It shouldn't feel like these are two different technologies. It, it should just be a natural extension of the warehouse. And trust me, when you see it, uh, it's exactly that. It's a natural extension, all in the same UI and, uh, and all built together and, and delivered together as a single solution. We do fast data ingestion. Um, so what we want to be able to do is deliver on quick time to value. So um, we have over 200 pre-built connectors. And so the well-trodden data integration paths are pretty much covered uh, by those connectors. And we also have APIs where you can extend, uh, if you had custom applications or something like that, uh, you do have the ability to, uh, to do that as well. And uh, we have been in the integration business for decades. So we really understand the business of data integration. We can help you, you know, design and deploy your integrations, but also we understand you know, how do you support mission critical integration uh, deployments because uh, oftentimes these things will break. You know, Salesforce will decide that they're going to add another field to a table. And we have the ability within our team to identify when integrations break to fix uh, the breakage and uh, to keep the business moving. So uh, great expertise in the area of data integration and something that we'd be happy to uh, engage with you on. Next slide. So um, you, know, you saw some of the customer logos early, earlier, um, some in financial services, you know, Lufthansa uh, for flight planning. Um, uh, we really understand data security. Um, so to begin with, the underlying database within the Action Avalanche technology um, was built from the ground up to be secure. Uh, so you know, we'll talk about here some of the, uh, the capabilities to provide. So the first is user authentication. So you can use the operating system if you're on-premise to authenticate the user. And just to confirm that the user is who they say they are, uh, you could use uh, LDAP, Open Directory. You choose what you want to use for a user user authentication mechanism. And so long as it's a pluggable authentication mechanism, we can just plug that in and, and it will work. Uh, we provide for discretionary access control. So you decide at the user group or role level who can access what within the database. We have role separation. So the role of the database administrator, um, they administer the environment, but they don't have access to the data within it. And as we move to a cloud service then, right, we serve in the role of database administrator, but we can't access access your data uh, within your database. Uh, we provide for security auditing, as you can audit all activity, whether successful or not, within the database. And also we have security alarms. So if you had maybe a rogue employee um, that was trying to look at the um, maybe salary information, um, the discretionary access control will keep them out of that table. Uh, but the fact that they tried to access it uh, could trigger an alarm, and then you could see what else they were up to kind of through your security audit logs. We provide for um, AES encryption for data at rest and data in motion. And built into the platform is uh, dynamic data masking. So you don't need to go to a third party uh, for data masking. Um, if you're not familiar with data masking, um, you know, you can have, if you have sensitive data, let's say it's a credit card number, and you want to represent all of the digits except for the last four by the letter X, and that would be the mask that you're using. And um, so unauthorized users would only get to see the last four digits. Um, authorized users get to see uh, the entire credit card number. So data masking is something that uh, was recently added to the, the database um, uh, at the request of a, a number of customers. 
On the right hand side, uh, we have a set of capabilities um, from a security perspective that are um, you know, unique to the cloud service. So uh, if you're deploying on premise, not all of these apply. Uh, the first is that we provide for a, a firewall at the cluster level. So each uh, cluster gets its own firewall. Um, it's a single tenant architecture, so you don't need to worry about data leakage. Uh, we provide for a key management service, uh, quite important for sensitive data. Uh, we provide for federated authentication and for end-to-end -end encryption. So all of the data that's stored within Action Avalanche in the public cloud uh, is encrypted uh, at rest. Uh, it's also encrypted in motion, so right the way until it gets into your device. Um, so if you're sitting, let's say you're in an airport lounge and uh, you're not sure about the security of the network you're on, you don't need to worry about uh, network sniffing. Uh, that data is encrypted right the way until it hits the uh, the application. And then you know we're SOC 2 compliant, which is important um, for a cloud service that's going to be handling sensitive data. Next slide. So oftentimes we get asked about TCO, right? People want to understand what is the, uh, the total cost of ownership uh, over a three-year period. So for the example that we have here, let's assume that um, the customer has a, uh, a traditional uh, appliance, and let's, let's assume Teradata for just to pick on them. Um, so let's assume that we've got 200 terabytes of data uh, compressed that will come down to just 50 terabytes. Uh, we can assume that we've got heavy concurrency between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., um, but just some batch jobs that run in the overnight hours. And here we're faced with a decision. Do we want to upgrade or do we want to move to Actian Avalanche in the cloud? So we'll you know, produce the, the TCO for this. So to begin with, you know, for this data volume, we're looking at about five appliances. Um, the operational expense um, for, uh, on an annualized basis for this is um, 800,000 in software and um, about 200,000 fully loaded for the database administrator for these five appliances. We've got the capital expense for the upgrade, so 2.4 million to refresh the, uh, the, the appliances, um, but there's no migration involved, right? That's going to be part of the, uh, the process of, of uh, the upgrade. So the TCO for this over three years is about 5.4 million. Now let's look to the column all the way to the right here for the hybrid cloud data warehouse where we've chosen Avalanche. So this workload can be met by a 32 AU um, cluster, and an AU is just a, a measure of the horsepower of the cluster uh, that Actian uses. Um, so 32 AUs will be deployed for peak time, that eight to eight, and put just eight AUs in the overnight because we're just handling the requirements of the, the batch jobs that are running. So what the cloud solution gives you is the ability to scale that environment minute by minute to meet the needs of your business, right? So eight to eight, we want 32 units. Uh, in the overnight, we want eight. And you're only paying for what you're using at that, uh, at that time, right? So that flexibility is great. Particularly, you know, maybe in the, uh, maybe over the weekend, uh, we're running the uh, eight AUs the entire uh, weekend long, depending upon, you know, how the uh, ETL and ELT jobs are set up. But uh, that's a huge advantage, right? Just paying for what you're using. From the uh, operational expense, uh, this will run about $500,000 per year, um, you know, given this particular usage pattern. There's no capital expense right here. It's, uh, it's all uh, operational expense. Um, but there is an expense associated with the migration. And this is obviously going to be a, a one-time thing. And depending upon the complexity of the migration and how much um, of that can be automated, it's typically anywhere from $400,000 to $700,000 um, for that migration. But it's a one-time cost, right? Once you've migrated, uh, you're over. So if we look at the TCO for this solution over the three years, including the cost of the migration, we're looking at anywhere from 1.9 to 2.2 million, depending upon you know, just how complex that migration was. So look at that relative, that 5.4 million number, right? So significantly better TCO over the three years, even when you include the cost of migration. So quite a compelling argument for it. Next slide, please. So if we were to say, you know, what truly differentiates Actian Avalanche? So the first is this industry leading price performance, right? So you decide is, is performance 
what matters or is it the cost, the value that you're getting for it that matters to you? And you have those two levers to pull. So if superlative performance is what you want, nobody's gonna beat us. Uh, if you're really focused on cost saving, um, you can deploy on Actium Avalanche and know for sure that's gonna cost you at least um, the, the saving that you're gonna get is 50% of, of what you're getting from uh, your Snowflake bill today, at least 50% savings. Uh, we run on premises and across the public clouds, right? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, Azure and AWS covered today. Uh, GCP is in the lab and uh, we're very excited to uh, get it to market as quickly as we can. Uh, we've tried to minimize the risk of migrations by developing a series of best practices around that and tooling that will allow us to evaluate the difficulty of the migration um, to uh, identify how much of that work can be automated and how much of it will need uh, manual intervention. And we have, as I mentioned earlier in HCL, uh, a great partner that uh, could help with that migration. Um, but we'll, we would also work with the system integrator of your choosing or train up your staff to, uh, to do it. And then we believe that we provide a future-proof solution by um, providing you with the ability to integrate with your existing ecosystem to you know, plug in the Actian Avalanche technologies wherever it makes sense for your business, whether that's on-premises, across the clouds, combination of that, and we provide you with the ability to do all of that. And it's completely extensible as you expand the scope of what you're doing, uh, Actian Avalanche can grow to meet your needs. Next slide. Oh, so at this point, we're going Thank to you, open Emma. it up for any Fortunately, questions. while the presentations were going on, we have been busy in the background answering the questions in chat. It would be great if you could take a moment and go through the remaining ones. So the first question here is, what data integration and visualization tools do you support? And, and shame on me for not covering this. All right, so uh, we, uh, we provide ODBC and JDBC connectivity to Avalanche. Um, so any tool that can interact with a database through ODBC and JDBC uh, is supported. Um, but we also have a number of custom connectors that we've built out. So on the ETL side of things, we've got connectors for Informatica and Data Stage and Talent and, and a host of other um, on the visualization side, it's Power BI and Tableau, uh, Looker and MicroStrategy, amongst uh, others. Those are the ones that that we get asked about most frequently. But uh, but yeah, typically all of the the data integration and visualization tools um, that will connect through standard connectivity um, will work with it. Um, and if a custom connector is required, uh, we are constantly growing the list of custom connectors that we support. Um, you know, for data movement, data integration, um, you never want to go through ODBC or JDBC, it would just be too slow. Um, but the, uh, and, and that's where custom connectors really become important. And uh, we're growing the list of connectors that we have there. Uh, the next question is what SQL dialect is supported? So we're ANSI SQL 2016 compliant and we're very much focused on being standards based. Uh, we want to make sure that as you build out uh, applications on top of Actian Avalanche um, that uh, you're not locked in that uh, if, we've, um, if we support a standard and you move to another standards-based solution, um, you know, you've got the flexibility to do exactly that. Um, and as we add new capabilities uh, and new, new functions into uh, Actian Avalanche, uh, we always look to the standard to make sure that we're compliant in that regard. In fact, the, uh, the language body is chaired by one of my engineers, so that's how focused on standards compliance we are. Next question is, does Actian Avalanche support database procedures? And, and yes, we do. And uh, what we find is that as people are migrating from other technologies to Actian Avalanche, uh, they'll oftentimes have made use of database procedures. And um, so the tooling that I mentioned earlier that we have to aid in a migration to Actian Avalanche uh, includes an analysis of your database procedures, and it makes every effort to, uh, to automate that migration process. Oh, next question is, can, uh, can you extend Actian Avalanche through UDFs? Um, so if you're not familiar with a UDF, it's a user-defined function. Um, so if you had a specific function um, that uh, wasn't supported by the database uh, that you needed uh, to add uh, to, uh, to meet your business needs, um, user-defined function capability gives you the ability to do that. And we support JavaScript 
and Python uh, UDFs. Uh, and we also have SQL UDFs. And where I think they're kind of fun to use is if you were doing something like a, uh, an Oracle uh, to Actian Avalanche migration. And uh, Oracle is known for being contrary when it comes to the standards. So if the standard says, you know, the parameters are laid out as A, B, C, uh, Oracle will typically go CBA. So um, what you could do is take a, uh, a SQL UDF um, that uh, actually just reverse the order of those um, of those parameters, so that uh, you know it would make your migration from Oracle that much smoother. Uh, do you focus on specific market verticals? Um, so it's not that we target specific verticals, but I think the, the performance and the real-time capabilities that we provide uh, mean that a lot of our customers are clustered in, in, in verticals. Um, and where we see most activity is in uh, financial services, healthcare, uh, retail, and logistics. Um, and, and for all of them, I think performance and uh, you know, real-time updates of the data are important. Uh, and that's probably why uh, they've selected our technology. And I think we have time for one more question, and that is, uh, can I see it in action? So yeah, I apologize that I didn't have time for a live demo today. Uh, but we do have a weekly live demo. It's on Thursdays at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. So you could catch this um, in the next month uh, tomorrow. And uh, if you are interested in seeing that live demo, if you visit www.actian.com slash avalanche, um, you can get more details uh, about how to sign up for it. Thank you, Emma, for the great presentation and helping with the q and I'd also like to thank Matt Aslett from 451 Research and Jeff Wies for their presentation. With that, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and uh, wish you well.